Today's Bible reading is on your Bible page 1686. Jesus appeared to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sin, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Every year, 2.3 billion Christians all around the world celebrate Pentecost. Then what is Pentecost? As many of us know, the word pent means number 50. Originally, Pentecost is the Jewish festival for harvest, which is celebrated on the 50th day after the Passover. For Christians, Pentecost is an important day of celebration as it marks the 50th, 50th day after Jesus' resurrection when the Holy Spirit came down upon the first Christians to form the church. Then what does Pentecost have to do with us today? This morning, we are going to explore that together. When I was younger, I often heard adults say this to me. Don't grow up. It is a trap. <laughs> I know it for a fact that a singer even titled her song with a phrase, Don't grow up. It is a trap. Why wouldn't we want to grow up? That is because life is tough. Shakespeare in his work Macbeth puts it this way. Each new morning, new widows howl, new orphans cry, and new sorrows strike heaven on the face. Life is full of unexpected twists. It is full of challenges and disappointments. As a pastor, I see that every day. When I meet people who are thinking of going into ministry, I use my own phrase and say to them, my friend, don't be a pastor, it is a trap. <laughs> Life is a tough. It is reality for all of us. The world we live in is a broken world where we face problems. But the Bible says something very encouraging. It says this in Hebrews, God's people are too good for this world. In other translations, it says that the world is not worthy of God's people, or the world does not deserve God's people. What does that mean? I think it means that Christians overcome the world. It means that we Christians transcend the world. And today's Bible story tells us how. In today's story, there are a few important points, and we are going to look at them today. And as we begin, would you join me in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for your presence that's with us now. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that awakens a sense of your presence in our lives and in our hearts. As we speak, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon us, that we may hear your voice, and as your words come to us, that you would change us, shape us, and restore us. 
You have the timely word for every one of us in this room. And we thank you for that. So Holy Spirit, come and speak to us now. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In the name of the Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. It is the first Easter evening, and Jesus' disciples are hiding in fear of the Jewish leaders who executed their leader. They are so afraid that they are now hiding. They had their, lock, their doors locked. And John, the writer of the gospel, begins the story using this interesting phrase. He writes, it was on the evening of the first day of the week. As we know, for Jews, a new day begins at sunset. And for them, the first day of, first day of the week is the day after the Sabbath day. Would you think about this with me? As many of us know, the Sabbath day is the day of rest for the Jews. They believe they must rest on the day as God rested after finishing the work of creation on the seventh day of the week. So this is what John is highlighting and saying here. Look, a new day has come. The new era has come. He is just saying a new world has come and now God will begin a new work. What is the new world? On the Easter evening, on the new day, the disciples see the resurrected Christ. The world that the risen Lord Jesus Christ rules has begun. And he comes and says, peace be with you. Friends, this morning, what do we say about our fears? our sorrows, and our disappointments. Jesus rose from the dead. A new world, a new era has begun. There is unlimited hope for those who believe in him. Today is a new day. Hallelujah. When the disciples saw the risen Christ, their fear turned into joy and peace came to them. In the same way, when you and I see the risen Christ, our fear turns into joy and peace comes into our hearts. In Christ, we overcome the world. Yesterday might have been a sad day. Last week might have been a terrible week. But friends, today is a new day in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that this morning? Then some of us might think, okay, Noah, Jesus rose from the dead. It is a historical fact, but where is he? We don't see him now and we can't touch him. How do we see Jesus who lived on earth 2,000 years ago today? And Jesus says this, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. When we hear the word spirit, what do we think of? What is spirit? Scientists define spirit as a non-substantial existence. What it means is that spirit does not have any form and structure. It does not have a flesh and bones. It is not bound in places and time. Christians who believe in the Bible would agree with that. But then mystics and agnostics would say that spirit is an energy or a force. They would say spirit cannot be known, but it can be controlled like electric power kept in battery storage. Christians would disagree with that and say, no, the spirit can be known, but it is not under any human control. Christians would say the spirit has a power, but is not a power itself as it is a person. The Holy Spirit can be known, but it cannot be controlled. 
Jesus says something very interesting about the Holy Spirit. He says the Holy Spirit is another helper. The words another helper translate from the Greek words alon parakleton. Parakleton or perikletos means helper. The Greek word alon means another. There are two Greek words meaning another. One is hetero, and the other is alon. The difference is, whereas hetero means another of a different kind, alon means another of the same kind. Here, Jesus used the word alon to call the Holy Spirit. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that the Holy Spirit is, is Jesus himself that exists in a non-substantial way. Are, we, are you with me? Some time ago, I had somebody say this to me. Noah, it is a little hard to believe what Christians say. Every Christian that I meet says that I have Jesus in my heart and I have a personal relationship with him. If Jesus is one, how can that be? I would say that can be because Jesus is with us now, we, with us now through the Holy Spirit. I like the analogy that Dr. Timothy Keller uses to illustrate it. Would you think about this with me for a moment? At this very moment, you all see me standing in front of you. You are all hearing me speak to you. You and I are in the same room together. However, you as individuals would not think that I am talking to you as if you are the only person in the room. I am with you, but not only you. After the service during morning tea, however, I might talk to you, I might walk to you and grab you and say, hey, John, how was your week? How was your job interview last week? Then we might have a chat and we would be connected with each other at that moment. It would be very personal and we would be drawn to each other. Keller says, that is what the Holy Spirit does. When the Holy Spirit is in our hearts, we would know Jesus not as somebody we read about in some history lesson, but as somebody we have a deep and personal connection with. When the Holy Spirit is in our hearts, the knowledge of Jesus becomes a personal, so personal that we would think of him as though I am the only person who he deals with in this world. J. Rodman Williams, theologian, puts it this way. When the Holy Spirit is in our hearts, we would believe that Jesus is real, not as simply an affirmation of distant faith, but out of a vivid, undeniable experience. Have you ever known Jesus that way? I know many of us in this room have. Last week, Gabby and I met with a lovely Christian couple. They opened up and shared with us that they were going through some challenges. And they said something like this, life has never been harder than this for us. We are pressed on every side. We do not know what the future holds for us. Every day is a challenge, but so strangely, we feel drawn to God in this season. In fact, we have never felt so close to God like this before. There is a great sense of a peace that runs deep in our hearts and it sustains us day by day. And we just know that everything will be okay as Jesus is with us. This morning, do you and I know Jesus that way? Here is a question for my Christian friends in this room. 
Is there any problem in this life that is bigger than Jesus? No, Jesus conquered the death. He opened the way to the eternal life. As Christians, we would say that no problem in this life is bigger than him. He is God incarnate who is all-powerful and all-knowing, then where would we find peace in this troubled and troubling life? Peace comes when we are with Jesus. It comes when we realize that he is with us. And the text says that the Holy Spirit helps us see Jesus who is with us now. Here is what I find very interesting about the story. Would you think about this with me for a moment? When the disciples were hiding in fear, did they not know Jesus was the Messiah? They knew who Jesus was. Before this, the disciples had seen miracles Jesus performed. They had been on the boat with him when he calmed a storm. Jesus had told them that he was going to suffer and die. And he had told them that he would rise to a new life after three days. They all knew that he was the Son of God. But until Jesus appeared to them and breathed on them, they could not believe in him. It was the Holy Spirit that enabled them to believe in him, not their intelligence. Apostle Paul says that every Christian has the Holy Spirit in them. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 says that without the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for anyone to profess that Jesus is the Lord. But Paul also says that not everyone, not every Christian, is filled with the Holy Spirit. He urges Christians to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the original Greek, the phrase is written in the present continuous tense. In other words, this is what Paul is really saying here. Go on being filled with the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. Here is a question. Is it possible to be a Christian and still feel despondent? Yes, it is. When facing a trial, Christians would feel tested, overwhelmed, and sometimes even paralyzed, just like the disciples who hid in the room. But then the, dis but then the Bible tells us not to forget that help is available. When we walk through the valley of the shadow in our lives, we can pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. So you to have the eyes of your heart always open to see Jesus who is with you in the midst of your trials. Don't be afraid. He is with you now. Open your eyes. He is with you. Friends, this morning, would you ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill your heart again? He will answer your prayer. That is what we celebrate on Pentecost. And here is the last thought that I would like to leave with you. In the story, we see that the Holy Spirit makes Jesus' presence known to the disciples not only as individuals, but also as a community. The reality of God's presence that grips us as individuals also grips us as a community that everyone in the group would all sense God moving in their midst. Church historians call that shared sense of God's presence an awakening or a revival. 
As many of you know, in the 1850s, with the rise of science and modernism, Christianity in the West was not so popular. For example, in the heart of London, there was this big Baptist church named New Park Street Chapel that seated about 1,500 people, but only about 150 were going to the church. But then suddenly, during this period of time, within a year, the church's attendance grew rapidly, and the church had 3,000 people coming every week. And in that year alone, 300 people got baptized. The place got so packed, they had to knock down the building, and they had to move a church to a concert hall nearby that seated about 10,000 people. But then the place got packed again, and they had to move to a place called Crystal Palace that seated 27,000 people, and they would have 27,000 people every week. As some of you know, Charles Spurgeon was the preacher at that church. What's interesting about the period of time is that it was not just Charles Spurgeon's church that grew rapidly. In the 1850s, revivals broke out across the world. In 1854, in New York, a prayer group that had started with six businessmen grew to be a gathering of 10,000 businessmen. In the 1850s, one-third of the entire population of Northern Ireland got converted to Christianity, and two million people became Christians across the United States. And a few decades later, a revival broke out in Asia. In 1907, a revival broke out in Pyongyang in North Korea. Until today, modern historians do not know how to explain this global phenomenon of the religious movement. But Christian theologians point to this period of time and call it a great awakening. They call it an extraordinary outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we see in the book of Acts, when on Pentecost 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit came upon people and 3,000 people got converted to Christianity after Peter preached a message about Jesus. Now, would you think about this with me? Jesus says this to his disciples who were going to be preachers and his witnesses. If you forgive anyone's sin, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sin, they are retained. Let me ask you a question. Generally, we would not like it when somebody gets up and says, you can be forgiven, would we? When somebody gets up and says, you can be forgiven, how would we respond? If I wasn't Christian, I would say, who are you to tell me that I am a sinner that needs forgiveness? What do you know about my life? What do you know about me? Wouldn't we say, oh, that is a little hypocritical when somebody gets up and calls us sinners? But Charles Spurgeon and the evangelist in the 1850s did that, and it worked. Peter did that on Pentecost Day 2,000 years ago, and it worked. Thousands of people got convinced that they were sinners who needed a savior in those times. What happened? It was the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and Jesus' presence was made known to them. The Holy Spirit was breathed into their soul so that the eyes of their hearts were open to see that Jesus is indeed the Son of God and that he died on the cross for me and that he rose from the dead. The presence of God was made known to them and they could see that God loves them 
and he had sent his one and only son, Jesus, to them so that they may have eternal life. And this can still happen today. And I pray that this would happen on the northern end of Gold Coast, in our city and in our nation, so that we would all know that we don't have to walk alone in this troubling world, but instead we may walk together and overcome the world. I hope you'd also be praying for the same as I do. When the wind blows, we cannot see it. We cannot touch it. We cannot chase it. But when the wind blows, we know that it does. Why? The tree leaves dance in the wind. When the wind blows, seeds on the ground are lifted and scattered. And the flowers blossom and they too dance in the wind. In the same way, when the Holy Spirit comes, we cannot touch him, we cannot chase him, but we know, we know it when it comes. Because Jesus' presence is made known to us in an extraordinary way. When the Holy Spirit comes, we hear him speak to our hearts. When he comes, our hearts are warmed up by his love, and sometimes tears of joy well up in our, in our eyes. When he comes, our souls dance in the wind. This morning, I pray and hope that you'd be filled with your Holy Spirit. I pray and hope that this church, we as a church, would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Pray that you'd be filled with him. Pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon your home, your families, your ministries, your church, and the northern end of Gold Coast and this nation. Let us pray. When the Christian church was it formed, they had just, they had this simple prayer. Three words, a prayer of three words. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. That was all that they said. And that prayer changed the lives of multitudes. Not by our might, not by our power, but by the Holy Spirit, says the Lord. But by my Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Fill our hearts. Breathe on us. Breathe on us. Breathe on our hearts. Lord, you see the parts of our hearts that are not well, that are broken that are stained, and I pray that you would breathe your Holy Spirit on them now. Change us, revive us, restore us, sanctify us, sanctify us, cleanse us. Holy Spirit, come. Fill this church. Fill the people in this church with your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, come, oh, come. Oh, come, Holy Spirit.